so this talk, I couldn't help but Photoshop this image. Uh, this is this is kind of how I think I was feeling this weekend after AGP one. Uh, I hope I hope some other teams, uh, some other proposals felt like this too, uh, coming after this weekend, especially Altair, who were just 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 made it, and I, you guys probably feel like a million bucks, so I don't want to take away from that, but. Essentially, yeah, this was huge news uh, over the weekend that we were all f in the team watching very carefully with, uh, with scripts, essentially, looking at the votes coming in, trickling in on Etherscan. Um, and I want to just take a look at these results and really, really say thank you to everyone who voted. Uh, with enormous support, we got over 7.5% uh, of, uh, of the token population in uh, on the Aragon network token to vote for Aragon 1 to support us as an independent team supporting the Aragon project going forward. Um, and before, before we continue, I do notice that there is, there is a small slight 3%. And so I'm curious if anybody here actually voted no. Did, did anyone vote no? Don't be afraid. No? No? Okay. All right. All right. That's good. I hope, I hope you know, this talk, you probably read the flock proposal, and so you, there's probably nothing you're going to gain from it, but I hope you find this entertaining and otherwise. Uh, and for the people who did vote no and aren't, are just too afraid to say, I hope I change your mind. So to look at 2019, I think we need to look back at, at 2018. Um, we've had a lot of talks about what last year was for us. Um, and it's kind of interesting because I, I follow up yesterday's acts, and we didn't really coordinate a lot in terms of how we made our presentation. So it's really interesting that we've come in a, in a distributed, decentralized kind of way of for consensus about thinking about the themes and the topics in the same way for Aragon 1. Um, Jorge said last year was the year of infrastructure. And I want to say that that's true, not just for the technology that we've built, but also for the governance that we've managed to build and the, the foundations that we have for the Aragon project in 2018. So this all started, I'd say, in, in, in February 14th, about a year ago. This was Lewis's love letter to the Aragon project and to decentralized organizations, right? He, in, the, in this blog post, we're going to be following a series of blog posts. Lewis basically laid out what it means for a nonprofit foundation to, uh, to look over and guide a decentralized project and to make it successful. What assets does it need? What controls does it need? What, how does it grow from there and how does it continue to evolve? Right, so after a couple periods of, of intense work, we come to May. And I, I promise you this is really intense work. I can attest to that myself. Uh, we launched 0 0.5 on Rinky B uh, after, after many weeks of trying to ship repeatedly. And we finally did that in the end of April. And it allowed us a, a little bit of time to think about what decentralizing the project would mean as we continued into 2018. So the second blog post, talks about the minimum viable foundation. And it's the natural step of how the Aragon Foundation, or the association now, will change over time. What 0 0.1 meant, what 1.0 meant means, what 2.0 means, what 3.0 means, and ultimately what it means to be, to, to dissolve, right? And so right now, we're at the association. We're at 1.0. We've come from an entirely centralized team into one that has a foundation, uh, or has a nonprofit, has, a, has an umbrella over uh, independent teams working on top of it. It owns assets, but it's going to continue to decentralize over the time. It's going to give up those assets, give control to them to the network. And that's where we started thinking about the Aragon Manifesto. Once we started thinking about what it means for the network to own assets, to have a life of its own, we needed to say, what does this network represent? And so we had, a, we had a very, very long workshop on this uh, as a team. And we came out with a number of principles that will guide us into the future as a project, not just as a team, as a movement, as a project. And so following this, uh, we came to the conclusion that we needed to announce Aragon 1. And May 14th, I believe, 16th, uh, Aragon 1 was announced to the world with this beautiful logo by Adri, uh, who designed the original uh, Aragon project logo. And so, this was the first step where we said the Aragon Foundation, or now association, is going to start giving away some of, uh, or not really giving away, but kind of delegating some of its, uh, some of its priorities into independent teams, uh, and which Aragon 1 is the founding team that has become independent now from the project. Uh, we then move on to, to talking about more teams, to saying, what does it mean for more than just Aragon 1 to work on this project? 
What does it mean for another team like the DEC, Altaric, or another FLAW team to come into the scene and to be an independent team under the umbrella of the network, and how do we get that going? Uh, this also includes Nest, because we see a lot of Nest grantees as independent teams as well, and they're working on really, really cool things uh, that are just totally blowing us away this weekend, and I, I want to give them props as well for that. So then we go over to, to August, where the DAC was, was announced, and it got kicked off. Um, we were in collaboration with Giveth for a few months before this, but this is when it really kick-started. And this was a huge step, because it meant we went from zero to one to two in the step of about four months. And this is really, really incredible, because as any technologist will tell you, going from zero to one is really difficult. Going from one to two is Again, difficult, going from 2 to 10 to N is a lot less challenging because you already have the foundations, you already have the established protocols that, we, that you already need when you, have, when you go from 1 to 2. Uh, and so this was a really exciting experiment that we had with the DAC. Uh, and unfortunately, they did not get into the AGP round in, in this time, but we hope that they'll, they'll come back again. Uh, and, and I'm honestly looking forward to seeing them again in the next AGP or, or another AGP down the line. And so going off of this, we had, we had done some experiments. And we, we decided that in, at the end of October, um, it was time for us to say we're opening up registrations for, for, new, uh, for new teams. We want new flock teams. We've gone through these processes. We found out what works. We found out what doesn't work. And we want more teams to start applying so that we can go from 2 to 3 to 4 to 10 to however many we need in the future uh, to, to make Aragon as a project successful and to maintain its sustainability. And then finally, we had the first AGP vote, which ultimately uh, ratified the process that we, we, we just had in January about how we make decisions as, an, as a project uh, and taking the decision making away from just us as a team into more of a decentralized community-based organization. Uh, organization. And so with this, I think we've, we've laid out a lot of the foundations for what we're going to look at in 2019 and what it means for Aragon 1 as a flaw team inside this infrastructure. Right now that we have this infrastructure, we have to use it. And we, we will only be successful if we use it properly uh, and we, we take advantage of its strengths. Aragon 1 abides by all the same rules as any other flaw team. Right? You see here, uh, this is in the Aragon slash flock GitHub repo. Uh, this was the first, I believe this was the first pull request merged, yeah. So we are the same as any other flaw team. We request to the association. You'll see here, it wasn't one of the developers, it wasn't Lewis, it wasn't Jorge, but it was Stefano, who is the executive director that merged and reviewed this pull request. Right? This is already getting to a level of independence. Although it's, it's just on GitHub, it already is establishing that protocol. We ask here, we say, the team, um, is the founding team. We intend to work on the project in the future. I, I mean, I hope that's the case. Uh, but we also ask for funding. We ask for this amount of money to cover us over the next year. Um, and then we'll see, you know, I hope some of you have read the full proposal. But it also outlines a number of, of different things inside, um, inside what it means to be a flaw team. Uh, and I want to say, before we get into those requirements, that this has always been the plan from, from, ver from version zero of the network. I took these graphics from the original white paper that was released in April of 2017. And in this diagram of the network ecosystem, of the value transfers that happen inside this ecosystem, we see here we have the Aragon network having proposals from the ANT voters that then uh, require services. They need things to be built. They need a decentralized court, et cetera. What does that mean? Well, that means as a service provider, Aragon 1 fits in really well here. In this other graphic, we see the deployment of the Aragon network. How will the association or how will the, the network ultimately be deployed from the association? Right? And so Aragon 1 again comes in really handily <laughs> right here where we slot in as the, the service provider that will deploy, build uh, the Aragon network, submit the AN uh, Aragon network address to the multi-sig, and then start the process of the association whittling itself down and giving more and more control into the network. But as a team, what does this really mean, right? So I alluded to this before. As a flaw team, we, we submit uh, requirements 
to the association. We get nothing for free from the association, right? As part of our flog proposal, we say, we want access to the blog. We want access to the GitHub repos. We need these tools to, pr to proactively work and to, to be productive. But we don't get these for free. We need to request them, right? We request for this funding. And this is a really good opportunity for us to stay hungry, because uh, we get these on one-year lifespans. And that means we have to be accountable. We have to be repeatable with the success. We, we get this funding, and then we say, these are our promises. This is what we want to deliver next year to the association. We say, this is what we've done in the last year. This is what we do, will do again in 2020. And then we leave it up to the, to the token holders to ultimately decide whether or not they want to re-grant us these permissions. And on a different level, it, it, it really changes the way we look at how we, how we uh, interact with the association, right? Because the association ultimately is the protector of the Aragon network right now. The, the network is in a seedling phase. It's starting to grow. We've planted the seeds, but it can't survive in the wild in an adverse environment. And so the Aragon project, the association, is protecting it. It has fiduciary duties. It has stewardship over this, this child that we've, that we've started to, to, to brew, I guess. <laughs> I can't really make a good analogy. Uh, but <laughs> what Aragon 1 then means is we have a level of indirection from this. We, we are accountable to the association. Uh, we provide services to the association who ultimately is stewarding the network. And this means that for proposals, I really have to reiterate this. If you ask Lewis or Jorge or one of us at this conference or any time, if you propose to Aragon 1, the result you get is an Aragon 1 result. It is not the association. It is not the project. But what can happen is if you propose through an official method like the AGPs, if you want to make a proclamation, if you want us to, say, support a different fork, a different network, do something for the community, et cetera, you go through an official process, you talk to the association, and then the association, if they ratify it, they say, all right, we may be able to do this, or we may shuttle it into a service provider, into a flock team like Aragon 1, who can then ultimately interact with the real world and enact these actions. Right? Uh, but with all of this said, it doesn't mean that as flock teams, we're completely independent from each other. Right? We still want to have these network effects of having teams working on the same thing, but be independent. And we go back, uh, not just up to the association, but to other teams, uh, through a lot of these shared resources that we have. So we all have shared resources on GitHub, but we also have the project blog. We, we've organized all dev calls very similarly to the Ethereum all dev calls, where we come together. Now it's about 20, 25, 30 people each uh, every two weeks for these all dev calls, um, where we talk about issues that we submit uh, ahead of time. And then there's also roadmap planning for, the, for six, months, six months of each coming uh, two quarters, I guess. Um, flaw teams propose what they'll be working on, uh, and then we kind of ratify this as a project roadmap so that uh, token holders kind of know what they're getting through each flaw team at six-month intervals. Before, before we get into more of the product things, I know I've talked a lot about governance, uh, and I'm really excited to get into the product things. I want to take us to a small demo uh, based on what Lewis announced yesterday. So backstage, if we could go to the demo. All right, so I actually, I actually had this on up on GitHub, knowing the network. Uh, so the Aragon desktop is something we're really, really excited to announce. I wanted to kind of show it off uh, on stage now that I've given it a chance. So I'm going to push the Publish button. So now it's available for everybody. <laughs> I want to kick it off. Hopefully IPFS is happy with this. All right, so we'll come on. We'll see mostly the same things. But you'll notice that the app right now has every feature that we currently have in the web app. If you want it to be on mobile, we can do that. We can make it mobile. If you want to run two versions, I found out this nice trick, two, two DAOs side by side, you can do that. Uh, I was going to demo a Rinkeby Ether transfer uh, based on one finance organization uh, transferring to another one. 
uh, but I, I didn't get that set up in time, and Rinkeby, with IPFS, the network in this, in this internet has been a little bit difficult, so we won't get to that. But it is available now for everybody to try, um, and I hope you play with it. Please let us know. It is a pre-release. We're just getting this out, uh, but we're really, really excited to see people run this. It runs an IPFS node locally, so you don't have to rely on the network once you fetched it once. Uh, in the future, we may also make it more decentralized by providing a light node, things like that, as research goes. Uh, backstage, if we could go to the slides. For 2019, I wanted to group what we're doing as part of a flock proposal in, in kind of four sets of challenges that we currently have with the product. The first one is voter turnout. We've talked a lot about making sustainable, scalable voting uh, this past couple of days. Um, we saw with AGP1, there was only about 2.5% uh, in the show, in the turnout for, uh, for token holders, which is incredible because it's now the process we use to govern the entire project. And only 2.5 people showed up for this, right? It's, it's kind of amazing that 97.5% that, uh, 90, didn't bother to, to care. Uh, but probably a lot of the reason was they had A&T and cold wallets and things like that. They, they found the gas price too expensive. They didn't want to vote. And so the first thing we have uh, on our roadmap in 2019 is to think about vote relaying. And I, I really <laughs> love this animation. So if, if we look at the world right now as it is, what we're trying to do is kind of reconfigure it in, in many ways. We're trying to rebuild voting infrastructure to be scalable, digital voting soft, uh, infrastructure, decentralized voting infrastructure to be sustainable and scalable. We want to have nodes, relayers, take, no, uh, take votes, batch them, send them out into the network so that each person doesn't have to have uh, a transaction be sent uh, and as well relayers can subsidize uh, every vote that comes in rather than um, each individual having to pay that themselves. So that's a really great use case for project governance, like our project, where the association can decide to subsidize uh, voting for AGP voting so that you don't have to deal with this UX of paying money every time you want to make a decision. The, the other one is voting delegation. And this is something we just started looking into, but it's something we hope to uh, we hope to propose in a future AGP and then to roll out um, as maybe the third or fourth AGP in this, uh, in this year, where we have very simple voting delegation of just one, one address to one address. Uh, unfortunately, delegation chains are, are very difficult given the, the, the environment, the execution environment we get with Ethereum. Um, if you have any ideas on, on better data structures, this is uh, an open advertisement to come talk to us. Uh, but up till now, we've had a really, really difficult time getting voting delegation past a couple of delegations. And we said one is probably enough just to try this out and to get a lot better turnout. The next one is a lot of UX challenges we have with our product. So up until yesterday, this is what the token manager looked like. And if you look at it, it's, it's not very friendly, right? Uh, my, my girlfriend, I was showing this to my girlfriend yesterday. And she was like, what are these, what are these strings? Like, who, who is that? Do I, how do I know what's going on, right? She took a look at the finance app and she's like, who are these, who are these transfers to? What does it all mean? I was like, okay, first, first you have to understand each of these could be a person, it could not be, but they're, they're essentially an address that we send money to, right? And so this is really difficult to get right. And this is a big problem with identity. So we have a, we have a few, research topics as well, but we really want to start integrating ENS into our application to start providing membership based on your ENS subdomain, uh, and then start resolving that inside the UI so that we can not just look at addresses uh, and not just ENS name, but also perhaps uh, a local address book that you start typing into so that you can configure the app to look how you want it based on your local knowledge. The second one is expressive permissions. So with, with Aragon OS right now, if you've looked into it, uh, I, I highly recommend looking at the ACL. It's a beast, but it provides incredible functionality. This is one of them. The, the ability to have permissioning on Aragon OS is, is very rich. We essentially have uh, a mini, mini, mini script uh, virtual machine running inside our ACL where you can actually, um, where you can actually start inputting inputs to say, I want to evaluate my permission based on some parameters that I get from a function. 
But this is impossible for anybody to use. And nobody, uh, to my knowledge, has used it. So what we want to do is make a UI, or I start, making, start thinking about and start making a nice UI for users to make this really easy. Uh, the next one is mobile. I think we've already looked at that. Jorge has given a demo. We won't go into that too much. And then the third one, this is perhaps one of the most important, is broadening our sandbox. So we have three applications right now on, on Aragon. Um, we want to make, of course, more. But through the last year, we've also found that a lot of teams, a lot of projects have come to us and said, what we get isn't enough. We don't get enough functionality. The, uh, the SDK that Arthur introduced yesterday has a bunch of limitations, and it's kind of uh, limiting what, imagine, what the uh, implementation space can be uh, as compared to someone's imagination. And so it's really funny. I have this graphic here, right? So there's, there's three little things we get. We get voting, finance, and the token manager. Uh, and it's in a box. But what we want to start doing is allow people from the UI to install applications. The first version of this will be upgrading existing apps. But then the next one will be uh, adding apps and then allowing anybody from the UI to find an application and to install it and test it. The next one is a payroll application that we're very, very excited to start rolling out internally uh, for now. But this is something that uh, a team called Protofire has done an incredible job at. And it looks literally amazing. This is essentially self-sovereign payroll. You get calculated based on the block. You can withdraw at any time. It is, I'm so, so excited to use this. And that's the other side of it. Uh, where a team can look at its payroll over the last year. It has a nice graph for how much people have been getting paid. And that is, that is real. Uh, we just are not rolling that out because of audits um, and other technical complications at this current time. The third and final thing uh, that we're working on is something called the agent app. And right now, we saw in the this, in this sandbox um, uh, clip art that the walls were limited, right? If we want an organization to talk to another organization, it's very difficult. Uh, you basically have to send raw transactions or like do something funny with, with your voting app. What we want to do, let's say Aragon 1 has some ANT that they want to send over to the DC. Maybe they want to stake it. Maybe they want to interact with another protocol like 0x uh, or Uniswap. We get them the agent app. The agent app has, uh, has an external function that allows you to execute arbitrary transactions. That agent app will be the one sending it to the, to, to the DC or, different, uh, or interacting with a different protocol. If they want to do the same thing, they install and instantiate an agent app, and they, they can do the same thing back. So this will really open up organizations to the world. Right now, we have these organizations kind of limited one by one. But to be really, really um, useful, they have to start interacting with the outside world. And as a culmination of that, we've always said from day one that the Aragon network is going to be this umbrella of, uh, of organizations. And I, I love this part from the video because it really, really puts us into, into reality. Right? The first part is we need organizations for the Aragon network to exist. And then the second part is the world's first digital jurisdiction. All right, so how do, we, how do we as a community keep Aragon 1 accountable? Well, the first part is we have a public roadmap, or we will have a public roadmap. Uh, this is something internal for now, and it looks really pretty. And we'll try and make this public and as pretty. Uh, we have GitHub projects um, that we translate these roadmaps into so that anybody can go on Aragon slash Aragon slash projects and take a look at where our high level um, where our high-level actions for 2019 are happening uh, through the roadmap. The last part is the dashboard. Uh, and this is something we're really excited to be using. We have on-chain statistics of what is actually happening with Aragon organizations. And so here you can see we have a bunch of uh, ANT. We have a bunch of ETH. Uh, unfortunately, we just did payroll, so our, our die is a little bit low. Uh, but you can start seeing, uh, or we can start seeing, we want to make this public soon, that um, all of these graphs uh, community members have access to, and that they can kind of tell how the network is, is going, what organizations are being used, how many active ones are there being used. And so we can really start to see what the network effects will be when organizations start interacting with each other. 
And all this is, of course, coming soon. We can't promise dates. We can only promise soon. So I want to end uh, by having a small, <laughs> small advertisement. If you're interested by any of this, we are hiring. So please look at that link uh, and talk to us at this conference. Uh, and I want to give a special celebration to Bingen and, and Joni, who have <laughs> So yesterday was Joni and Bingen's uh, one-year anniversary at, at Aragon One, and we're really, really happy to have them. Thank you.